Bending the Dark Revival has been an absolute joy so far. You can tell the Meatly and everyone behind the project truly poured the heart and soul into this one. And so here we are, with chapter 1 before us. In this video, we will be pulling the Magician's Current away to see how the team produced all the encounters in this chapter. From the jump scares, to things out of bounds, to, uh, a second set of arms on Audrey's back? There's a lot to cover, and break. So if you enjoy all things Bendy, consider subscribing right now, so you don't miss my coverage of all the later chapters. But without further ado, I hope you enjoy this bizarre breakdown. So normally, I do a quick recap here to refresh people on the series of events that takes place in what I'm covering, but for this video, I will break the recap up and present parts as we go along. Because this chapter is kind of long. So the chapter starts, and Audrey's in a room that has a pool of ink in it. We need to look for ladder pieces that honestly, I'm pretty sure she doesn't need. But in this room, there's actually a stairway hidden beneath the ink. You can't walk down it, but it's there. I was not able to find anyone crying out of bounds though, so those crying noises are coming from an invisible source. So we climb up this ladder, and we go down this hallway, and Wilson starts a monologue over the loudspeaker about trying to catch Audrey. Now as we move along, we eventually come to a vent that has a piper in it. Now normally this piper falls down and scares the crap out of you. I literally jumped when this happened. But this is what it looks like from a different angle, so you can see that this dude just sort of spawns up here and then immediately falls down. But what's interesting is that up ahead there's actually a Boris. So as we climb up these handholds, there's a switch off to our right that we need to hit, but there's a door off to our left, and behind that door is Boris. Now if we move the character behind this door before we open it, we can actually just walk through Boris. He would not respond to us, and we can't do anything. But the second we pull this switch, Boris will start walking, and he walks around this corner, and he will just vanish. Now before moving on, I just want to say that this map is huge. A lot of parts of this map are unloaded, and they load in sequentially as you navigate, while older places unload. But just seeing an overhead view of this area um, kind of shows you how massive this area is going to be. But we're going to push on forward, and the first thing we come across is this vent. Now when we enter this room, the vent cover to the left actually slams shut. And it definitely makes you jump a bit, but if we were to remove this vent completely, it shows you that there is actually nothing behind the vent at all. It's also too small to crouch into, so we can't enter it. Now as we wander into this grand room with this fountain in the middle, there is a scripted jump scare that happens when you try to climb the bricks up top. And you can look straight up and see no piper, but the second you start climbing, a piper pops up and jump scares you. And then you have to run into the hiding area. Well, the way the game actually pulls us off is that they just load in a piper instantly the second you're about to reach the top of those bricks. He comes out of nowhere and he chases the player. Now, when we go inside that box, something else interesting happens. The piper that is chasing us sort of just disappears. And as you can see, another piper just loads in and gives us another jump scare. And then this piper just wanders off to the right and then they just vanish. And speaking of things appearing and vanishing, well, our next thing is related to that too. Because as we go to the fountain and open this box, well, Alice just spawns out of the ground. She legitly just pops out of the ground and she's right there. Now viewing this cutscene from a different angle, of course, is strange. But by doing so, we're going to be able to see what happens to Alice the second this cutscene ends. Now normally, there's a noise and the player looks off to the right, and then they look back and she's gone. And that's precisely what happens. The second the player looks away, she just straight up gets Thanos snapped out of existence. And this is a very common trick that the developers use in this game. But as we make our way further and further into the studio, we come across a cupboard that has writing inside of it. We basically open this thing on the wall, there's a message inside of it that tells us to turn around, and then once we do, the message is replaced with a different message. And now what's interesting is that the player's direction doesn't actually determine whether or not this message unloads and loads in the other. It is 100% tied to the specific camera that is currently active in the game. But of course, we can just force this to advance, and as we do so, the text just snaps into place. Now, not long after this, we encounter a door that closes right in front of us as a fissure slams it shut. And in order to progress, we must go hit a switch, and then the door will open. But as you probably guessed it, from the other side, that fissure shuts the door, and then they instantly vanish. So we grab some keys and we push a cart, and then next up there is a door that a striker or like a mutant striker jumps at. And the second it jump scares us, it then runs off to the left and disappears. And it's actually an object that the enemy runs behind before they disappear, so that if we were to look quickly, we would not see them vanish. But while I was trying to check this out and get this from a different perspective, I realized something else. And that was my character, Audrey, had double arms. So there's like a second pair of arms just floating out of view from the player. 
Now this could be a couple things, and some of these things are actually things that we've been experimenting with in Zardi's Maze 2, the game that I'm making. But my hypothesis is that the reason why they do this is so that they can swap between the animations, so the cutscenes, and the player character themselves that we play as. Oftentimes, these are two separate things, and they are swapped between each other, but an illusion must be created so that the player does not notice that swap. Sometimes games even use really small hands, and the perspective just makes them look the same. So once Alice calls to us through this pipe, that striker thing returns, and it drops from the ceiling and it chases us. And the same striker will run back to its hole in the ceiling, jump up straight into it, and just despawn. Now, we have a lot of sneaking around to do to get ourselves a fuse and then finally get ourselves a gem pipe. And when we finally get to that gem pipe, it is just straight up sticking out the side of this lost one. Now, obviously, I know I'm looking at an ink-covered character, but I still want to see who is behind the mask. So, I removed the burlap sack, and as you can see, it is a lifeless, lost one whose face is obscured to us in the game. So, there you go. So now that we finally have our weapon of choice, I find it kind of funny that Audrey just swings this pipe unenthusiastically. Now, of course, there is no point in animating the whole body because you never see it, but looking at it from this perspective is just really funny. And because of that duplicate view caused by the first person camera that I was talking about before, well, we have a second floating giant pipe. And this one is projected onto the environment and it looks really odd. Now ahead of us is this giant puddle of ink. And when Audrey steps into this ink, her body starts going into shock. And then these faces come out of the ink and start moaning at her. And viewing this encounter from a different point of view shows that these faces are actually hollow. They have no back into them and they just recede back into the ink and disappear. And this next area in general has quite a lot of things to look at. So we're gonna go through them. So first up, we're coming towards this door and a searcher pops up and starts banging against the door and then they obscure it with ink. Well, viewing that from the other room, you can see that the second this searcher puts ink on the window, they like sacrifice themselves and become the ink ball on the window. And of course, then they just fade away. We can also take a look at this other searcher who Audrey then learns the banished skill from. As we mosey on through this creepy area, we come across a giant pit, and then a chair falls down said pit. Now this pit actually goes down quite a ways, and it's solid black all the way down. Unfortunately, for those of you who are furniture enthusiasts, the chair does not remain down here. It is destroyed the second it falls down the pit. But to quickly distract us from our loss, we have this locker right next to the pit and it has something inside of it. Now, normally, if you were to open this locker, a mutated fissure would come out and start chasing you. But if we look inside the locker, we can see that there is no fissure inside of it until that door is opened. So it's basically just a shaking, empty locker. After we avoid them beating us to death, we then enter this area where Joey Drew does audio tours of these different installations of the studio. And in this area, there are four different rooms that have doors in the back of them. Now, if we enter any of these rooms with a camera, or even the player, it doesn't really matter, none of these doors lead to anywhere. They all just end abruptly, and there's nothing behind them. However, it is kind of neat seeing these rooms from a different perspective. And of course, at this point, we now encounter Bendy. Now, Bendy's playing with his toy train, but I wanted to see what would happen if we walk past Bendy and just skip them all together. And if we bypass Bendy, they just don't care. They continue to play with the toy train, and even if we sneak up behind them and bash their head open with a pipe, they have no cares in the world. However, in this encounter, I did want to see where Bendy actually went, because Bendy gets scared by Audrey and then runs around that corner, and we don't get to see where they go. So here's that same encounter from a different perspective, and Bendy runs around the corner, and then he just freezes in place while Audrey finishes the cutscene. And as soon as that cutscene is over, he vanishes. Now we have one final encounter for Chapter 1, and then we are done, and that is with the Ink Demon himself. So as we draw to the end of the chapter, we hear these voices as the ink demon begins to talk to us. And as we push on to that final lever, well, the ink demon finally does catch up with us. Now this is a pretty intense scene. You flip that lever and then you can see the ink demon like inching closer and closer to you. And then you barely make it through the door and Bendy's hand comes through and tries to grab you. It's like clawing at the wall. And then the door finally closes. And with that, chapter two begins. So how does that work? How does that really intense sequence work at the end of the chapter? 
Well, you're probably not surprised by this, but the Ink Demon is actually stored beneath the ground when the cutscene starts. We can find the Ink Demon below the map, and they are just a complete black silhouette, and then when they first appear, they actually rise up through the floor. And the thing is, they don't actually animate Bendy fully, because Audrey keeps looking away, and every time Audrey looks away, they slide Bendy through the hallway a little bit. And because it's not on camera, they don't have to do it with animation. Now, when Bendy gets his hand stuck in the door, he's actually just sitting there on the other side of the door, sort of frozen in place. And when his hand comes back through, he totally just drops to the floor. He goes back to where he came from, into the great beyond. It's very interesting seeing how simple this execution is, but how powerful an effect it causes. And with this final thing, Chapter 1 comes to a close. I hope you enjoyed this adventure, and I highly recommend subscribing because I'm going to do this with each and every chapter. And until then, cheers.